And during those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. This is Rev 9-6. This one has no author given, and it is called In the Mirror. Normally, you sleep soundly, but the thunderstorm raging outside is stirring you from your sleep. You begin to doze, then another crash jolts you awake. The cycle lasts most of the night, so you lay there, eyes open and outward, Looking at your room, stretching out before you in oblong shadows. Your eyes move from nameless object to object until you reach your mirror, sitting adjacent to you across the room. Suddenly a flash of lightning and the mirror flickers in illumination. For a scant second, the mirror reveals to you dozens of faces, silhouettes within its frame, mouths open and eyes blackened. They stare out at you, their black pupils fixed upon your face. Then it is done. Are you sure of what you have seen? Unsettled, you don't sleep for the rest of the evening. The next morning you remove the mirror from your wall and toss it in the trash. It didn't matter if the vision you had seen was of truth or falsehood. You wanted to be rid of that mirror. In fact, you scrap every mirror in your house. Weeks pass and the event of that night falls into passive memory. You are spending the day at a friend's house and it's time to use the bathroom. While you are in there, the faucet starts to run without you prompting it. Taken aback by this, you do not yet act, trying to reason with your paranoia in your mind. The water starts to steam, and a skin of moisture covers the mirror up above. You're watching intently as words form. Please return the mirrors. We miss watching you sleep at night. This next story is written by Heidi Holden and is entitled The Playhouse. Painted white with green trim, just like the old main house, the little playhouse sits amongst the birch trees and blueberry bushes and poison ivy. Created for the original family's children a century earlier, it is surely the manifestation of indulgent love. Down to the last detail, the playhouse is a miniature replica of the farmhouse designed and built by the father for his family. The trimmings, the windows, the door are elaborately decorated. Inside the house, a tiny bunk with a real feather pillow and handmade quilts sits in the corner by a window. In the center, a white table and set of chairs all stenciled with colorful fruits. Against the wall, opposite the door, the miniature olive green stove stands below the buttercup yellow cupboards. There are teacups and saucers and plates and pots and pans, all child size of course, randomly setting on the available surfaces. An empty baby buggy is parked at the foot of the bed. So much potential. The prospect of property sitting for the current owner, a widower who is on his way to stay the winter months with his Arizona living daughter, sounds like a wonderful opportunity for a young and struggling family of four. To live rent free in return for caring for the home and grounds is not to be passed up. The family moves into the temporary situation as the leaves turn red and brown and yellow and begin to fall off the trees. The youngest child, a boy, 
is too small to attend school. He plays with his toys or watches TV while his mother sees to the household. The father works in the city of Lakeville as a veterinarian. Since he is the newest addition to the hospital, he is responsible for the nights, weekends, and other emergency calls. The daughter, a third grader, is an aspiring ice skater and is focused on fitting into yet another new school. The girl is overjoyed to be living in such a big and exciting place. The home is old enough to have a carriage house, a small kitchen, and proper living accommodations for staff, such as a butler and maid. On the first floor, leaving the kitchen through the formal dining room attached to the kitchen, a door opens to the main living areas which consist of an entry area by the front door, a living room, an office, and a sunroom overlooking the apple orchard. In the receiving area, a large grand staircase gives way to the second floor where the family bedrooms and bathrooms and the door to the attic resides. With regard to the help quarters, an access door is also present on the second floor as well as a private stairway leading up from the kitchen. The family decides since heating a home in the winter is expensive, especially when the home is old and uses oil for its furnace that they will keep to the help quarters to reduce costs. It is a friendly area, especially the kitchen, that is bright and cheerful and warm. But the children on occasion wander into the other part of the house to explore, and the girl discovers quickly that the family may not be as welcome in the home as first thought. The boy likes to haul his trucks and matchbox cars to the living room. He spends hours putting around entertaining himself, seemingly enamored with the vast space within which to play. The girl, however, struggles to move beyond the dining room into the entryway or pass through from their quarters onto the upstairs landing. There is a heaviness and a feeling of anxiety, like the girl is making someone upset and angry by being there. The lure of the office is great. The owner is a retired geology professor who has floor-to-ceiling shelving full of soil and sand and rock samples that is of interest to the girl. Being sometimes brave, she runs from the safety of the family quarters to the office to gaze on to the matching glass vials full of wondrous things. She does not stay long. The thought of having to cross back through the house becomes overwhelming. She always races back, passing her brother, noticing that he seems not to be bothered and wonders why it is that she alone feels the ominous energy. The true letdown is the playhouse. The girl can barely contain her enthusiasm as she bounds across the lawn, down the path, to the edge of the woods where the playhouse nestles neatly between the manicured lawn to the right and the woods to the left. Peering through the lawn side window, she sees the child-sized furniture and toys and swinging around to the front door, excitedly places the key into the padlock. The door squeaks as it swings open, and the girl, who is taught to close doors behind her, pauses. She can feel the same heavy energy that resides in the house. The girl is not one to be afraid, she is not scared of the dark, or monsters, or water, or other normal things that frighten kids. But there is an invisible face, an angry, undefined figure watching her from the window on the wooded side of the house. She is very sure of this, determined to play anyway, and very much dismayed. The girl stays for 20 or so minutes before she gives up. Locking the padlock, she grasps the key tightly and runs back to the safety of the main house's kitchen. Many times the girl tries to spend time in the playhouse. Each time, even while leaving the door open and in broad daylight, the same evil and frightening form floats back and forth by the wood size window as soon as she enters. The girl cannot see it, but she feels it. 
its oscillating bubble of anger mixed with lewd joy of having such an effect on her. Thus, her play in the house is short-lived, and her disappointment is soothed only by the relief of leaving that place behind. On her ninth birthday, November 6th to be exact, the family plans a small party. The girl has one school friend to invite, and the celebration takes place during the afternoon, in the kitchen at the small breakfast table. As birthdays go, it is typical cake and ice cream and presents. Around 7 o'clock, the school friend is picked up by parents, and the father is summoned to an emergency and leaves the house also. The mother prepares a bath for herself. The children, who argue at times, are in the kitchen fighting over the helium-filled birthday balloons. The boy has them, the strings tightly wrapped around his tiny hand. The girl, poised to pounce on the boy, is interrupted by her mother. She warns her brother not to move or else. Up the stairs she goes to retrieve a fresh towel for the mother. The chore completed, the girl bounds down the stairs to re-engage over the captured balloons. Her balloons. But the boy is no longer in the kitchen. Incensed, the girl curses her brother in a whisper. He is somewhere in the dark house and if she wants her balloons back, it's obvious to the girl that she is going to have to go and get them. Breath held, she opens the door leading from the dining room into the grand entryway, confronting the blast of uncomfortable, cold, and heavy air she calls to the boy. He had better bring her balloons back right now, right now. She receives no response. She knows she must find the light switch. Feeling with her hand, she locates the panel and clicks. Many times. Nothing happens. She remembers now that the owner tripped the power circuits to many of the interior locations. It makes sense. The family agreed to stay in the quarters only and electricity is expensive. Further aggravated, she listens. But there are no sounds to be heard except for her own footsteps. She moves carefully through the house. The darkness is cut by the light of the silvered moon, streaming haphazardly through the half-closed window drapes. The boy is not in the entryway, nor is he in the living room, nor the study, nor the sunroom. Ascending the giant staircase, the girl comes upon the landing. The door to the family quarters is in front of her, she gingerly opens it to see if her brother has gone that way, but it does not look so. She continues to inspect the second floor, looking left and then right. All of the bedroom and bathroom doors are closed. The girl approaches the first floor on the left and leans in to listen. She knows that surely the boy can't be completely silent in his escapade, but she hears nothing. She moves on to the next door, and the next, down the line, but there is nothing to find. No one to find. Frustrated, the girl, hands on her hips, says out loud, I wish I were an only child. Met with shadows and silence, and distraught with having to be in such an uncomfortable situation, the last place left to look is the attic but the girl finds that the door is locked. There is a deadbolt that is secured. The boy is not going to be up there. The house has been searched, and there is no sign of the boy or the birthday balloons. So the girl returns to the kitchen, assuming that the boy must have found a truly devious hiding spot. Strange though, as he is usually not that good at deception. The lure of the balloons waning for the moment. The girl puts on a kettle of water to make tea. The kitchen is dim with only a small light above the stove illuminating the room. Choosing a cup and saucer, she smells the tea bag as she awaits the boiling water and stares at the kettle. 
Something catches her ear. Yes, there is a faint noise, a small, scratching scritch scratch. Her body naturally turns to the noise to hear it better. Yes, left. A tiny head freezes, peering at her from the outside in, through the window. A wicked little grin and flash of balloons gone. Just like that. He's outside? Incredulous, the little girl, certain that the boy is going to let her birthday balloons go free, turns on the exterior light and walks out of the house. Minutes go by as she searches to the edge of the visibility perimeter. Standing at the precipice between the precious, illuminated porch and the dark vastness of the property land, there is distinct giggling in the distance. The fact that her little brother seemingly isn't scared makes her furious. He's out there, laughing. She gathers herself, and taking a deep breath steps one step into the darker side of the out there. Then another step. Then another. In her pocket, the girl remembers putting her keychain flashlight. Better use it because she is well down the path closer to the woods than the main house, closer to the playhouse, a tiny wee stream of light to see by. I'm going to pop them, she hears a voice say, disembodied by the black of night. The door to the playhouse is open, and the girl, upon casting her key light forth, can see shimmers of a jovial surface, the balloons and then into focus an outline of a small figure seated on the bunk. No, no you don't, she says, plunging herself into the playhouse. The want of retrieving the balloons, no, actually the want to override the fear that plagues her otherwise drives her forward. She trips over landing and stumbles, and once to her feet she desperately faces her thief. His red eyes sparkle. I don't think that you were capable at first, but your tenacity is fierce, it says. Nature can most assuredly use a girl of your talents. It pauses. It says, To keep things in balance, you see, deeds are done, and you are my favorite. Lights approach bouncing along like luminous jellyfish floating on top of angry ocean waters. There are shouts of people and chaos, and two police in uniforms arrive breathless at the playhouse. Kneeling beside the girl, one of the men attempts to take something out of her grasp. Another has removed his jacket and uniform, using the t-shirt underneath to cover her neck and chest. The girl notices that she is bloodied, a continuous stream of life flowing away, seeping down through cracks in the wooden floor to the earth underneath. She watches curiously as the fire aid provide oxygen and struggle to insert an IV into her collapsed vein. It's all wondrous and um, gentle and peaceful is the silence like a loud radio that is suddenly shut off to the relief of every sense. The girl peers curiously into the window of the playhouse, on the wooden side of course, at the unfolding scene. More police and aid persons arrive. An officer with a lamp shines it on the bunk, the one with the feather pillows and homemade quilts. The little body of the boy, his head, arms and legs have been eviscerated, but obviously and crudely sewn back on like a rag doll. Above him, gently nudged up against the ceiling, are the birthday balloons, still shimmery through the blood splatter. The mother is stabbed and drowned in the bathtub, one officer says to another taking notes. The father is also dead, found his vehicle still in the garage, throat cut. The girl is deceased, just pronounced, another states. This is one of the worst crime scenes I've ever been witness to. 
Man, it's creepy out here, another officer says. I feel like I'm being watched. Stop whining and get to investigating. Make sure you preserve this crime scene, the third officer commands. Anyone find the murder weapon? No, the young officer is correct. God damn right it's creepy. This is the seventh time in my decades as chief that I've been called to this address, he says. Joining the officers is an older woman with gray hair and heavily wrinkled face. You'll be looking for a slender fillet knife, by the way. Sorry, sir. Um, I mean, ma'am. Didn't know you were on the scene yet. The lieutenant straightens his already neat overcoat. Officer Buckland has recovered the knife. It's with forensics. The girl, she was... It was in her hand. The aged officer puffs on a pipe and opens a tattered-looking folder. The lieutenant and nearby officers surround her and look over her shoulder at the pages. Photos. Some yellowed by time. The scenes are all rather identical, don't you think? He said, pausing. As soon as it was built, they should have burned this place to the ground and given it back to the Wampano. Like a horrible, serene dream, the girl stands in the dark woods, removed from the playhouse by some hundred yards. The scene of time no longer apparent, and the voices on the human scene are muffled, mostly inaudible now. She is amongst the shadows, and beside her, is the being with the bright red eyes. There are so many of us in the woods. What are all these? Monsters? She asks the form, pointing at the others behind them. A teeth-bearing smile forms, and the creature winks one of its crimson eyes at her. Don't be harsh, my lovely. All these forms, the beautiful and myself, the heinous, are all part of nature, and all part of you, and you of them. Judge them not, and judge me not, for nature demands balance, and achieves it by any means. You mean they are people? But who? The girl pleads. They are just ones who came before you, the creature sues. Humankind is taken to interfering with the delicate cycle of life and death. What they fail to grasp in nature still collects her bounty one way or another. Feeling the many presences close to her now, she is comforted and sickened at the same time. She says, What do you mean? I don't understand. For every old human in the hospital down the hill, who is revived back to life when that human should have died 20 years ago from heart disease, or every girl who was resuscitated when she should have drowned in the Kansas River. Well, since they didn't go, others had to, you see. Smirking, the creature continues. Nature is truth, and she has finite ways of doing her business. I nearly drowned in the Kansas River? The girl's voice trails off to nothing. So who then are you? She asks, trembling, her green eyes filling with tears. Ironic, isn't it? There are so many humans on the planet, unnaturally. Multiple homicide is becoming necessary. Do you see now? Its distinct gaze turns, falls to the pale girl. Its eyes glowing like fire embers look upon her lifeless face, and slowly through its wretched sharp smile it whispers, I'm you, of course. This one was written by Solar Goat, and it's called She Talks in Her Sleep. My wife talks in her sleep. Most nights I don't notice. I'm quite a deep sleeper, and so I sleep through it. But some nights I'll wake up to the murmuring. It's not that loud, so I'll usually just drift back to sleep. If I can't go back to sleep, I'll either grumble something or give her a nudge and it stops. Lately, out of curiosity and mostly amusement, I've been trying to work out what she's saying. 
One of my colleagues has a partner who talks in their sleep. Apparently they say the most random things. I placed a notepad and pen on the side table in the event I wake up to her talking. In the morning we'll have a laugh about whatever nonsense sentences she'll say. That was the idea anyway. It's surprisingly hard to work out though. The deep raspy murmurs, combined with the fact I'm half asleep myself, makes it quite a challenge to make out the words. However. I have noticed the name Annabelle come up quite a lot. Annabelle, do this. And? Listen to me, Annabelle. That sort of stuff. Last night I woke up to the talking again. It was a little louder than usual. Annabelle, let me in. I heard over and over, louder and louder, in a terrifying voice. I lay there in the darkness until it stopped. In the morning I told her about it. She said she could remember only one thing last night. A woman. Her face inches away from hers. Leaning over her as she lies in bed. A dream she says she gets every night. My wife doesn't talk in her sleep. Her name is Annabelle. And every night, something visits her. This one is by Scary Stories Daily, 2017. And it's called, The Face in the Crowd. I saw a woman the other day, and I'll never forget her. She wasn't particularly pretty or anything like that. I was putting groceries in the trunk of my car when I looked up and saw her sitting in the back seat of a car, some few feet away. There was a man outside the car, talking on his phone, but I was too far to hear him. She mouthed something, but I couldn't tell what she had said. Not then, at least. It wasn't until I got home, put away my purchases, and turned on the television, that my heart sank. There, on the local news, was the story of a kidnapped woman. She was the woman in the car that I had seen. Thinking back to her, I realized what it was she had tried to say. Help me. If you have a creepy pasta or a ghost story that you'd like to share, send it to Rev96Pod at gmail.com You can also find me on Facebook at Rev96Podcast and Instagram and Twitter under the same name.